Hello, and welcome to Benyo Chats. If you're curious about the world, this show is for you. What is most misunderstood about the state of climate science today? On this episode, I speak to Zeke Hausfather. Zeke is a climate scientist and energy systems analyst whose research focuses on observational temperature records, climate models, and mitigation technologies. He is a director of climate and energy at the Breakthrough Institute as well as a regular writer for Carbon Brief. I followed his research for a while. He is consistently deeply knowledgeable across a range of climate science and where it touches policy, innovation, and economics. I was excited to chat with him on his thoughts post COP26 and his latest thinking. He is also an excellent communicator. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe as it helps others find the podcast. Thank you, be well. Hey everyone, I'm super excited to have Zeke Hausfather uh, speaking with me today. Uh, Zeke is a climate scientist, so we're going to get all into climate. Zeke, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. So what do you think is most misunderstood about the state of uh, the climate science today? Um, I guess I read a, a lot of stuff about what previously was thought of as business as usual. Uh, a lot of people refer to this kind of RCP 8.5. And it seems to me that the consensus of climate scientists are probably uh, saying that that's not likely to, to happen as a kind of central case. Um, but I don't know whether what you thought about what is maybe most misunderstood or, or perhaps uh, most in uh, most being challenged at the moment. Sure. Uh, so, you know, it's it's always hard to communicate all the nuances to, of climate science uh, to a, a general audience. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very complicated field. The Earth is an incredibly complicated system, and there are a lot of big uncertainties in how the climate responds uh, based on our emissions. Um, and so, with that that said, sort of two areas where I think there are often common misconceptions around climate is one the extent to which climate change is inevitable. Um, so, one area where there has been a lot of progress in recent years, uh, and this is something that was featured fairly heavily in the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, or, or IPCC report, um, is this question of, you know, how much warming is sort of in the pipeline? Uh, how much warming is locked in today based on our past emissions of greenhouse gases? Uh, and what's interesting is that previously there was sort of a fairly widespread understanding that a certain amount of warming was locked in. Um, and that's based on the fact that if you were to keep the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere constant for the next 100 years or so, you would indeed have another half a degree or so of warming on top of what we've already had today. And the reason for that is because um, the oceans sort of buffer the rate of warming of the Earth's surface. Water can absorb an enormous amount of heat, uh, upwards of 90% of all the heat being trapped by greenhouse gases today is going into the oceans. Uh, and so the Earth has warmed up considerably less than it would if it didn't have these oceans that are absorbing a ton of the extra heat that's being trapped by greenhouse gases. Uh, and so because of that, at current levels of greenhouse gases, you know, as the oceans continue to heat up, the surface will also continue to heat up. But the important part of that, and where it leads to some confusion, is at current levels of greenhouse gases. Now, the amount of greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere depend in part on our historical emissions of greenhouse gases, but also on our future emissions. And so if we can actually get CO2 emissions, in particular, all the way down to zero, then the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere doesn't stay flat, it actually starts declining. And the reason for that is because the oceans and the land is absorbing some of the CO2 we emitted in the past on an ongoing basis. Um, and you know, the system will eventually reach a new equilibrium, which will be higher than it was before we started emitting CO2. But there still is a decent amount of CO2 currently in the atmosphere that will be absorbed by natural sinks if we can get CO2 emissions to zero. And it turns out that the cooling that that would cause, the falling levels of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, due to absorption by land and ocean carbon sinks, is almost perfectly balanced out by the additional warming you get as the oceans you know, come up to an equilibrium with the atmosphere. Uh, and so the net in, across you know, many different Earth system models that we've run is that once you get CO2 emissions all the way down to zero, global warming stops. Um, and that's good news and bad news. The, the bad news is the Earth does not cool back down, uh, at least for many, many centuries to come uh, once we get emissions to zero. So we're sort of stuck with whatever level of warming we had when we finally get to net zero emissions. Um, the good news, though, is that it means there's not a, any you know, amount of warming that's inevitable. We can control how much warming 
we end up experiencing by when we get to net zero emissions. Now, I should note that there is some warming inevitable, not for physical reasons, but for economic reasons, simply because, you know, we can't wave a magic wand and get all of our emissions to zero tomorrow. You know, we're probably not going to be able to get global CO2 emissions to zero before 2050. And so, you know, there's probably going to be about half a degree more warming simply because, you know, we can't reduce emissions fast enough due to technological and economic reasons. But from a climate system perspective, there's no additional warming that we experience once we get emissions all the way, all the way to zero. And, and so that's uh, an area, you know, that I think we can help clear up some misunderstandings around and that is potentially pretty empowering for folks because it means we ultimately have control over, you know, the degree of warming that the earth experiences. Sure, um, okay. Yeah. And then the other area which you sort of teed up earlier is around sort of where we're headed uh, in terms of emissions. So about a decade ago, um, which is when the, the previous IPCC report came out, um, you know, and, and a little before that, in particular, when the, the previous generation of emission scenarios were being created by researchers, uh, it seemed we we're in for a pretty dark climate future. Uh, global emissions had increased by 30% over the, the 2000s, and were increasing by 3% a year. Global coal use had almost doubled. China was building a new coal plant every three days. Uh, and the idea that the 21st century would be dominated by coal and we could end up with doubling or even tripling emissions by the end of the century didn't seem that far-fetched. Uh, and so those were scenarios where scientists thought we could end up at four or five C warming. Um, you know, flash forward about a decade and we're in a very different world right now. Um, global coal use peaked back in 2013 and the IEA has recently estimated that it's in structural decline going forward. Um, clean energy like wind and solar is the cheapest new form of energy at the margin in many places around the world. And, and global emissions um, have been, you know, relatively flat for the last decade. Fossil fuel emissions have been increasing by only about 1% compared to 3% the prior decade. Uh, and emissions from land use, according to our most recent estimates, have actually been slightly decreasing, uh, mostly balancing out the increase in fossil fuel use. So it seems like the world is now entering a long plateau in emissions, um, rather than continuing increasing emissions, driven by a combination of falling clean energy prices and governments enacting stronger policies to actually start dealing with climate change in a, a much more meaningful way than they were a decade ago. Now, flat emissions still means that the level of CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing. Uh, in fact, flat emissions means that the rate of warming stabilizes. So the world keeps warming at you know, not 0.2 C per decade, uh, rather than the warming accelerating. Uh, which is still not a very good outcome, right? We, we don't want warming to continue at its same pace. We want warming to slow down and ultimately stop. Uh, and for that to happen, we don't just need to flatten our emissions. We need to get them all the way down to zero. But this flattening of emissions means that the world we're heading toward right now is probably one of around three degrees warming or a little below three degrees under policies in place today, rather than the four or five degrees that seemed plausible a decade ago. Uh, and that's good news. You know, a three degree world is certainly still not one we want to live in. It would have, you know, catastrophic impacts for some human and natural systems. Um, and, you know, the world doesn't end in 2100, even though our models, do. you know, a world of flat emissions after 2100 would still reach four degrees by 2150 and potentially even five degrees by 2200. Um, so, you know, it doesn't change the fact that we ultimately need to get emissions down to zero. But it is good news. Uh, and it means that you know, it's much easier to envision a world where we sort of further bend the curve of emissions down to meet Paris Agreement goals of, of limiting warming to well below two degrees uh, than it was in a world where we were still headed for, you know, four or five degrees warming. Um, so I think that's been a, a really big change over the last few years, a really big realization by the sort of climate science and energy modeling community. Um, and it has led to us, you know, starting to focus a bit more in terms of the impacts of a three degree world rather than the sort of four or five degree worlds that we tended to, to focus on a lot, uh, you know, in the last decade. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. It's a, a kind of nuanced message actually from climate science because on the one hand, you don't want to play down the fact that these are serious risks and you need to, we need to take them very seriously because you still have, uh, you know, climate denial and people who, who not. On the one hand, you also don't want to um, say that actually those doomsday scenarios, uh, which were actually looking plausible 10 or 20 years ago, are no look at now no longer looking so plausible. And that's particularly because, uh, from my view, you often get these people who have what I would call learned helplessness, right? If you, think you, if you think you're going to be doomed, then you kind of do nothing. And you see some of this in surveys where you're saying, oh, 
you know, some children are thinking, you know, going to it's doomsday, and so why should we try anything? So it's kind of like we need to take them seriously, but actually we have done a lot of progress in in ten years. Is that kind of a reasonable summation of what something is a little bit more nuanced? I, I think so. Um, you know, it's important to emphasize that we already are seeing, you know, dangerous effects of climate change today at, at one point two C global warming. Um, you know. Uh, where I live in California, we now have a, a smoky season and a fire season um, because every year, you know, we're seeing worse and worse catastrophic wildfires. Um, you know, we've seen extreme heat waves beyond anything people predicted in the Pacific Northwest earlier this year, you know, flooding across of Europe and China and parts of the US. You know, we're, we're really already starting to see climate impacts in a big way where we are today. And so, you know, if you double that amount of warming or more than double that amount of warming to close to three degrees, you know, it's it's not a world we want to live in. It's, it's Oh, it's, it's not one that's probably, you know, the end of the world or like the end of the human civilization or anything quite that dramatic, uh, but it certainly is not a, a world we want to, live to leave to future generations. Um, and it's also worth emphasizing that our emissions are only one of three different uncertainties that we as scientists grapple with when we're trying to figure out how the planet will warm in the future. Um, so the other two are the sensitivity of the climate to our emissions. So essentially how much warming do you get as the amount of CO2 increases in the atmosphere? And the reason that is uncertain is because there's lots of different feedbacks in the Earth's system. So as the planet warms, you have more evaporation, you have more water vapor in the atmosphere that can stay there before it precipitates out. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas that enhances the amount of warming we get. You have melting ice sheets and sea ice um, that you know reveal darker surfaces underneath that absorb more of the sun's rays and change what we call the albedo of the planet. Um, you have changes in cloud formations that, depending on how they interact, can either lead to more or less warming. Um, and so none of these things are known precisely. Um, we have a good understanding of many of them, but it still means that when we're trying to estimate how much the climate will warm as a result of increasing CO2 in the atmosphere, um, we end up with this range. Um, and we've narrowed that range in recent years, but it still is a range. So for example, in the most recent IPCC report, um, we said that if we double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere um, and wait till the system reaches equilibrium, so the ocean you know, warms up to match that, uh, we'll end up with somewhere between 2.5 and four degrees of warming. Uh, that's sort of our, our likely range. So, so one sigma, if you will. Um, the two sigma range is I think two to five degrees warming. Uh, and so you know, we still don't know precisely where in that range we'll land. Uh, and then the other uncertainty we have to deal with is what we call carbon cycle feedbacks. So right now, when we emit CO2 into the atmosphere, about half of it, or a little bit more than half of it actually, is absorbed by the oceans and the land. And that's a really good thing. You know, Climate change would be more than twice as bad if the Earth was not absorbing some of the emissions that we're putting up today. But the ability of the Earth to absorb those emissions, the ability of the ocean to keep taking up some of our extra CO2, the ability of the lands uh, to you know, increase forested area, uh, increase, you know, leaf size as a response to increasing CO2, to sequester more CO2 in the soil, all of that can be affected by the warming of the planet. So, for example, when the oceans become more acidic as they're absorbing CO2, that can actually decrease the ability of surface waters to absorb more CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, similarly, as the land warms, you know, we see more catastrophic wildfires, as we're having here on the West Coast, we see more soil moisture evaporation, which can lead to carbon loss from soils. Um, and so we expect the ability of the biosphere and the oceans to absorb our extra emissions will decrease as the earth warms. Exactly how much, however, is a little bit uncertain. And so when you put together those different uncertainties, you know, even though we say we're on track for a world of, of just under three degrees warming today under current policies, we can't rule out the chance that that might be four degrees warming. Instead, you know, it might only be a 5% chance we end up at four degrees under current policies today, but, you know, that's a pretty big risk to take. And so it's not just the central warming estimates that we should talk about, even though we tend to focus on them a lot. It's these tail risks um, that can really dominate the potential impacts because the damages associated with climate change are very nonlinear. You know, three degrees is much worse than two degrees. Four degrees is much, much, much worse than three degrees uh, across many different systems. Uh, and then finally, I should mention that when we talk about these global average warming levels, you know, we're doing ourselves a little bit of a disservice. No one lives in the global average. In fact, you know, the global average is mostly oceans. Um, and on the land areas where we all live, the rate of warming we've experienced has been much higher. In fact, over the last 150 years, the land areas have warmed uh, about 50% faster than the world as a whole, uh, and almost twice as fast, or, you know, 70 
or so percent faster than the oceans. Uh, and so even though the world as a whole has warmed by only about 1.2 C since pre-industrial times, the land areas on average have warmed by about 1.9 degrees C. Uh, and we expect that difference to continue as the world warms. So that means a three degree C future is really a four and a half degree C future on average of the land areas um, where you know, people tend to actually live. Uh, and even more than that in high latitude areas. Um, so you can start seeing some really big changes uh, associated with these, you know, what seem at least when you hear them, relatively modest changes in the global mean. Um, you know, I like to use to ground myself on this is the last ice age, uh, which I think everyone would recognize as a very different planet than we have today. Uh, it was only about five to seven degrees C cooler uh, in terms of global average temperatures than our current climate today. Uh, and so we could, you know, end up halfway, sort of half an ice age unit difference in warming uh, under current policies or more uh, by the end of the century, um, which is a huge change for our planet. Sure, I mean, that puts a lot in perspective. That's risen so many questions in my, um, <laughs> uh, in my head, which is great. So uh, a couple are, yeah, I'm, uh, so I work a lot with models and we kind of know that every single model is always wrong. So kind of, I sometimes get a bit worried about this point estimate uh, for, I think, the things you sort of said, which is actually it's giving us a slight guide to something which is quite complex. Um, one question which comes up that I'm asked is, what are the chances of a kind of feedback loop which gets to so-called, I guess people call these tipping points, but something which is so bad that we kind of uh, end up in another kind of uh, another kind of phase. And my reading of the literature suggests that within a, say, at least the three degree band, uh, sort of the tipping points, which would seem to be very catastrophic that some people talk about, don't seem to be likely. But I'm not sure if I've, if I've read that properly. And then are there tail risks on either side of that? And then my second one on the tail risks is, I guess this is on the slightly hopeful as well as, as the other side is, I can't tell, and there seems to be a thing about how symmetric or not these tail risks are, as in I guess people don't really know, but, is it plausible that we could also hit some really good things as well as some really bad things? Although I guess the good things are more likely to come from innovation breakthroughs, but they, they might also happen on, on, on the landmass side. Um, maybe I'll stop there because I've got something about the differences also in, in the fact that it's not equal over the landmass either. Some places are going to be really hit hard and actually some places might even do a little bit better, which is one of the really uh, difficult things to grapple with across, across the whole globe. Uh, but maybe the first one is, yeah, this idea on tipping points. Are, uh, is a kind of tipping point risk to the downside likely within a three degree or four degree sort of range? Or what's your view of the reading of the science? Yeah, so tipping points is an area where I think we as a scientific community have not done a great job of communicating to the general public. Because when people think of tipping points, they think of sort of everything is fine. You suddenly pass a point, everything falls apart. We go to hell in a handbasket, you know, runaway global warming, the earth becomes Venus, the oceans evaporate. Woe is us. Um, that's not going to happen. Um, but at the same time, there are real points where you start to see big changes, particularly to specific ecosystems. And I think the, the story around tipping points is less a global snowballing of climate change and more uh, a series of very impactful regional effects that can happen as the earth warms. Um, some of then contribute to additional warming going forward. Um, so some tipping points that we have a lot of confidence about are things like coral reefs. Um, so coral uh, can only generally survive in a fairly narrow temperature band that it's adapted to. Um, you know, corals can evolve over time, um, but the rate of change we're seeing right now is, is much faster than has been experienced um, in much of the earth's history. And so, you know, if you have more than you know, 1.5 to 2 degrees warming, uh, most reefs in the world are going to be gone. Uh, and that, you know, reefs provide a huge benefit to fisheries, um, to coastal protection, you know, tourism revenue for islands. Uh, there's a lot of, of really negative impacts uh, when coral reefs disappear. Uh, and, you know, at 1.5 degrees, many of them are, are in, in great peril. And at 2 degrees, most of them are gone, barring a, a few specific locations that have unique characteristics like cold water upwelling or, or other things that can, can lead the reefs to, to be more preserved. Um, a similar type of regional effect is that you know, areas of the Amazon that are already under a lot of pressure from deforestation um, with, you know, a two degree plus warming world could start to transition into more of a savanna type ecosystem that could be tough to, to restore back to a tropical rainforest in the future. Um, and that's, you know, due to the interaction of climate change and 
deforestation. And so by tackling either of those, you can reduce the risk of that. But certainly you could see some sort of ecosystem phase shifts like that. You know, similarly, boreal forests are subject to a lot of stressors. Um, you know, wildfires are going to reach further and further north as the world warms. Um, areas, you know, vegetative cover is going to change in those regions, which can have big effects on, on the local climate there. Um, you know, there's potential changes in monsoon patterns, but those are a lot more uncertain. Um, there's a slowdown of the thermal halion circulation that's been observed that's, you know, projected to continue, even if an abrupt collapse seems unlikely. Uh, and that can have a big effect on rain, regional rainfall patterns. It can actually lead to some by itself regional cooling uh, in parts of Northern Europe, though that would be, you know, overwhelmed by the, the longer term warming we'd experience in that world. So you'd have you know, a bit less warming in those regions. Um, you know, Arctic sea ice is likely to disappear in the summer uh, around 1.5 degrees or a little below, um, which kind of big effects on the ecosystems there. Uh, and then, you know, the permafrost in the Arctic. So there's an enormous amount of carbon uh, and sort of vegetative matter in the soils that's frozen in the north. And as those regions warm, those start to melt uh, and release methane and carbon dioxide. Now, in most cases, these are somewhat gradual processes. So it's not like you reach a certain point and suddenly there's a methane bomb and all the you know, methane and carbon dioxide from permafrost you know, goes up in the air at once, right? Uh, it's more you know, the lower latitude areas start thawing faster than the higher latitude areas, south facing surfaces thaw faster than north facing surfaces. Um, and so you get you know, a more gradual response than the popular conception would lead you to believe. Um, but importantly, a lot of these systems that we call tipping points are characterized by uh, hysteresis. And what hysteresis means is that once you start changing it, it's much more difficult to reverse it. So, you know, ice sheets are a good example here. Um, there's a lot of ice sheet dynamics where you could have very rapid ice sheet loss um, in places like Antarctic and Greenland as the world warms. And you'd have to cool temperatures back well below pre-industrial levels to get most of those ice sheets back once they've you know, started to disintegrate. Um, and so again, it's, it's less about a cliff we fall off and more a slippery slope we start going down. Um, the net effect of all these changes is, is going to have a lot of big regional impacts. It's going to lead to some long-term additional global climate change due to um, things like more you know, CO2 emissions and to a lesser extent, methane emissions, um, but because the methane is, is slowly emitted, the CO2 effect is much bigger. Uh, from permafrost, uh, you know, changes in albedo associated with sea ice loss, uh, though a lot of that is already included in our models and our future projections. Um, but few of these tipping points that we've identified really have the, you know, a likelihood to lead to a substantial amount of additional warming beyond what is already in our models today at least, you know, in worlds that warm, say, three degrees or less. Um, it becomes a little bit more challenging to project exactly what will happen once we start getting beyond that. Um, you know, the, the last interglacial period was probably about a degree warmer than where we are today, so a, a little under three degrees. And we didn't see, you know, obviously, we, sea levels were 80 meters higher or whatever than they are today. We saw some very long-term major <laughs> Earth system changes. Uh, but we didn't see, you know, sort of runaway temperature change or, or very large temperature feedbacks in the last interglacial. And so that kind of gives us a reasonable amount of hope that we're not going to see similar types of very large changes, you know, at under three degrees warming. Once you get past that, you sort of get more into the, the world of the unknown. You're, you're in a climate that is sort of unprecedented, at least for the last, you know, three to 12 million years. Um, and then the odds of, you know, bigger surprises become larger. Uh, an example of this is there's a paper by uh, Takeo Schneider and his team at Caltech uh, a couple of years back, where they looked at what happens under very high warming scenarios. So say a world of 1200 parts per million CO2, you know, 5C warming above pre-industrial. Uh, and what they found is that, you know, beyond a certain point, you start losing much of the stratocumulus cloud decks that cover the world's oceans um, over the course of, you know, a few years. Uh, and that leads to another 6C warming on top of the 5C warming you already have over the course of a decade or two. You know, that's the sort of catastrophic okay. tipping points Stroke that, tipping you know, point. yeah. Um, now, obviously, that was a very simple model, you know, that didn't have global coverage. And there's a lot of scientific debate over how accurate those sort of things are. 
but the odds of those sort of surprises become, you know, notably higher in a world of, of four or five degrees warming than a world under three degrees warming. So it's, it's a very good incentive to try to limit warming as much as possible. Um, they're also, and I should mention this because I think it's, it's an important point, is as we reduce our emissions, the tail risks fall faster than the mean risk. That is to say, you know, the odds of four degrees warming fall faster than the odds of three degrees warming, or sort of the, the 95th percentile of warming outcomes falls faster than the 50th percentile, which is good. Uh, and it means, you know, we can minimize these, you know, tail risks by reducing our emissions uh, in a way that's important. Um, as to your other question about, you know, good surprises, um, you know, certainly when we talk about uncertainties in the climate system, like climate sensitivity and carbon cycle feedbacks, those uncertainties work both ways, right? You know, we, we run our models, you know, based on, at least for carbon cycle feedbacks, a central estimate and the models themselves have a wide range of, of climate sensitivities. Um, but it certainly is possible that we could, you know, think we're in store for a three degree world and end up in a two degree one, just like we could think we're in store for a three degree world and end up in a four degree one. Um, the challenge is, is that because the damages of warming are so asymmetric, you know, that risk of four degrees is much, influences our calculus in a way that's much more important than, you know, a risk of getting lucky and only ending up two degrees, right? So when it comes to climate change, uncertainty is, is decidedly not our friend, even if it means we could get lucky uh, and end up, you know, beating our climate goals when we don't expect to. Yeah, okay. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And, and sorry, I, guess, I forgot your your last uh, question. Of the well, I, I guess it was the it was the sort of the uh, we have referred to it a little bit was the the downsides of having just point estimates. And I partly mm -hmm. think of that because um, I have I, I guess I had a couple of people tell me, oh, if we don't hit one point five, like, well, that's it then, isn't it? And, and this is the idea of like, no, actually, you know, one point six is better than one point seven, and it's better than one point eight for the reasons that you give. Because not only is your your mean temperature down, but your tail risk has gone from being fat tails to hopefully thin tails or non-existent tails so that everything matters and the kind of the simplicity of the message of a of a number i can see has really resonating and has got people through but then that has that has partially uh, overclouded some of the some of the nuance which has then led to these kind of interesting uh other kind of uh other kind of debates and i didn't really know whether where to fall down on it except that it, it did seem that some people um, I guess some people not in good faith, but then some also in good faith um, are slightly just misinterpreting about how how you can use a point estimate because you need to use it in the context of everything else. And that doesn't yeah. fit easily within a tweet or something like that, right? So what I like to say is that climate change is ultimately a matter of degrees rather than thresholds. You know, there's, there's no specific points that we know of where things go from like fine to bad. Uh, or bad to catastrophic, you know, it's, it's a gradient. And that's true across most of the things we consider tipping points for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's not a single point where the system goes from fine to bad. It's, you know, it gets progressively worse with more and more hysteresis uh, in some of these systems. Um, and, you know, I think it's a bit of an unfortunate side effect of the way that we've created these global climate targets that they've become interpreted by a lot of people as thresholds. Um, whereas in reality, you know, they are somewhat arbitrary constructs. You know, we have a lot of literature about how four degrees, or sorry, two degrees is worse than 1.5 degrees and three degrees is worse than two degrees. But again, it's not, it doesn't go from, there's none of these impacts to suddenly there's all of these impacts when you pass 1.5 or when you pass two, right? It's, they're all getting gradually worse between those. Uh, and so, you know, we really need to try to emphasize to people that every 10th of a degree matters, that even if we can't limit warming to 1.5 degrees, which, you know, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, we're not going to limit warming to 1.5 degrees and we can dive into that in a little bit if you want. Um, you know, it doesn't mean the world's going to end. It doesn't mean we should give up hope. It means it's, in fact, all the more important that we limit warming to 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, you know, wh wherever we can get uh, that isn't, you know, three degrees, that isn't four degrees. Uh, and again, part of that is around the minimization of these tail risks. Because again, a best estimate of 1.8 could be, you know, 2.5 degrees if we're really unlucky with some of these climate system uncertainties. Um, and so the further we can bring that, that point estimate down, uh, the more we're minimizing these tail risk outcomes. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we'll we'll come back to your 1.5 and, and maybe also to COP26 as well. But one extension of this, which I was intrigued from, from your view, because it's a little bit further uh, along from your work, is I guess what I would call uh, climate um, economics. And to tell you the truth, I haven't been super impressed by some of the economics uh, papers, but maybe that's because I also don't really understand what they're, what they're trying to say. 
Uh, but some of the economics suggest, you know, when they try and parse this into something like GDP, that you're talking about kind of a 10% impact on, on GDP or global GDP, which is actually quite a lot, but kind of seems uh, manageable, particularly if you mitigate and, and adapt. But it doesn't seem to have accounted for some of the things that you've talked about, like localized tipping points or the fact that some countries might be completely devastated, um, you know, and that, that falls unequal on, on the world. Plus, when I kind of look at their models, I'm just like, wow, there's so many assumptions in there. I just feel it's even more uncertain than where we've got from uh, some of the climate model stuff, which actually in, in its central scenarios, and a lot of you guys are doing the modeling, kind of are agreeing about where we're, we're pointing, whereas that doesn't seem to be when they're trying to translate that into the kind of economics part. Do you have any view on how it's translating into economics or how climate uh, economics are thinking about this? I mean... Climate economics is, is a challenging field because you're looking at such long time horizons um, and such big uncertainties, uh, both in terms of how the climate will change, but also in terms of how our societies will change. Um, that, you know, I, I think it can be instructive at times, but I think, you know, like a lot of applications of economics, uh, there's a danger in, in using it sort of over interpreting it uh, and, you know, overemphasizing certain economics outcomes for these very distant futures. Um, you know, it's it's really hard to model the impacts of climate change on the economy. Um, historically, a lot of economic assessments of climate damages have been dominated by, you know, uh, agricultural impacts because um, they're one of the easier things to to try to model from climate change. Uh, and sometimes, you know, sea level rise uh, impacts. Um, but we don't really have good estimates on like what are the costs of increased wildfires, what are the costs of increased tropical cyclone uh, intensities and rainfall. You know. What are the costs of uh, tree mortality from like pine bark beetles spreading or, um, you know, disease vectors increasing or, you know, any of the myriad other impacts of climate change, both known and potentially unknown as we, you know, rapidly end up in a future world. Um, and there's also these very thorny issues you get into when you're looking at climate impacts in, in the economics literature on discounting, right? You know, mm -hmm. there is certainly a justification in economics to discount future earnings versus current earnings and, and discount future damages versus current damages um, with the assumption that the world is going to be richer in the future and you know the, those will be relatively smaller in terms of their welfare impacts but it gets tricky when you start talking about intergenerational problems like this um, you know there there have been some big thinkers Kenneth Arrow comes to mind a few other folks have really written compellingly on this question of intergenerational discounting and, and equity uh, and how to best treat that and oftentimes the discount rate more than any other factor in these sort of economic models for climate change really dominates the solution space in terms of, you know, does your optimal outcome become two degrees warming or 3.6 degrees warming or whatever. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it, it can be a useful exercise, but I think we should take it with a, a veritable boulder of salt, um, particularly when we look at, at very long time horizons. Uh, the other thing that's I think has been useful coming out of the economics literature is sort of the, the interesting interactions of sort of socioeconomics and climate damages. Um, so, in the latest IPCC report, we introduced a, a new set of scenarios called the Shared Socioeconomic Pathways or the SSPs. And what's interesting about them is they look at five different sort of socioeconomic and, and technological futures for the planet. Um, and within each of those different pathways, we look at, you know, what would the world look like under different mitigation? So what if we do nothing about climate change all the way down to what if we try to limit warming to one and a half degrees? And by doing that, you can sort of look at the impacts of a particular level of climate change across different sets of possible futures. Um, so if you're looking at a three degree warming world, you can look at a three degree warming world in the context of a, a world where everyone is rich and equal, you know, where we have um, almost no poverty, where, you know, there's really very little difference between rich and poor countries by the end of the century, um, where everyone is very technologically advanced, there's a lot of adaptive capacity. There, you know, a three degree world still wreaks havoc on natural systems. But, humanity can mostly adapt to that, right? Um, whereas if you look at a different pathway, uh, a world that has very high population growth, low economic growth, um, there's very high inequality, regional conflicts, isolationism, um, you know, that's a world where three degrees is much, much more damaging um, because there's huge amounts of the world that does not have access to adaptive capacity, that doesn't have access to the resources needed to build seawalls, to install air conditioning, to genetically engineer crops to be heat tolerant, to, you know, Keep people indoors uh, and out of the sun on extreme heat events, um, you know, and, and so I, I think the economics literature does help us in terms of those interactions because they are very important and, and we can't really ignore them. Um, but at the same time, I think it does a disservice when we interpret it too literally 
given the huge uncertainties and what the damages of climate change will ultimately be um, and how you know societies will respond to them. Yeah, um, that makes a lot of sense. Although I do know a couple of economists who basically say, you know, basically, if you don't really discount future generations, you treat future generations how you'd want to treat yourself, like you treat your children, grandchildren, and great trying to help you yourself, then that slightly answers the solution because you get to this same answer, which is actually you want to do uh, an awful lot, right? Because you want to give future mm -hmm. generations essentially um, what you want to give uh, yourself. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to paint all of climate economists with a broad brush. No, no. You know, I, are... <laughs> well, it's complicated, like you say. And, like and Fran Moore and, and, and Gernot Wagner and a number of those other folks are doing really good work around these, these tough issues. Um, but like even you say, long term the very... discounting yeah. is a very, uh, you, you get a certain set of answers from it, uh, which, you know, which is what the models and things say, but it's, it's very hard, like discounting up to 2100, right? It's um, you, a lot of things which we are uh, definitively going to be wrong about. Um, maybe that's a good segue into COP26. And um, perhaps my question here would be is, what did you take away from it, which was kind of positive or, and what did you take away, which was maybe a little bit uh, disappointing? I was kind of intrigued by, uh, some of the analysis, there's been a couple of kind of snap analysis, one by IEA and another by climate resources and things saying, well, if we meet all of these commitments and things, we could be looking at a, at a sub two degree world, like 1.8, 1.9. And then you had a lot of critics saying, well, a lot of those uh, commitments just don't seem to be really uh, realistic. So that probably means we're not going to hit uh, and we're not going to hit sub two. And then a counter to that would be kind of what you've suggested is, but, you know, direction of travel is really good. And 10 years ago, we wouldn't have thought uh, that that we were there. So that's perhaps a segue into why you may or may not think 1.5 is achievable. Actually, sub two might be plausible, uh, but maybe seen through the lens of any positive things coming out of COP26 and any things you thought were a bit more disappointing. Yeah, so I should mention that... Um... I was in Glasgow uh, and I actually put together an analysis with uh, Pierce Forster at the University of Leeds where we looked at you know, all of these different projections that were coming out from you know, Climate Action Tracker, the IA, uh, Climate Resources, um, the United Nations Environmental Program, et cetera, during COP uh, and sort of comparing and contrasting them and discussing these sort of different scenarios. So I'm, I'm happy to provide a link to that. Um, but ultimately, you know, I think COP26 moved the needle in the right direction in an important way even if you know it wasn't a breakthrough moment in the way that, say, Paris was, um, but I also think people had somewhat unrealistic expectations going into it. You know, the COP process was never set up to be, uh, you know, the world sits around and does nothing, and suddenly we all get together and announce some giant breakthrough, right? The, the, the way the system is set up is that countries update their commitments in the lead up to COP26, uh, and then you know there might be some small new announcements during the COP itself. Uh, but it's mostly sort of working through all these thorny issues around, you know, climate finance and adaptation funding, um, you know, the way carbon markets are going to work and be managed, uh, you know, the, the way you deal with, uh, you know, forest accounting uh, and emissions reporting and all these other sort of gnarly details, which some of which are quite important uh, around the implementation of the Paris framework. Um, and so we did see some meaningful new commitments at COP. The Global Methane Pledge definitely moved the needle uh, more than most things. You know, there's uh, an important uh, pledge by Vietnam and South Korea and other countries to accelerate their coal phase out schedules. Um, there was, uh, you know, a compact on deforestation. There was some announcements around electric vehicles that were important. Um, you know, there's some updates to NDCs, uh, NDCs being nationally determined contributions, the sort of promises countries make under the Paris Agreement to reduce their emissions. Uh, in particular, we saw some new net zero commitments uh, that were quite impressive from India uh, that, you know, if implemented, can move the needle. Uh, and so sort of where we are coming out of COP is that going into the conference, the world was on track for about 2.6 or 2.7 C warming best estimate. And again, plus or minus one degree C based on climate system uncertainties. Um, under policies in place today uh, and under sort of 2030 commitments under the Paris Agreement, we're on track for, for probably around 2.4 degrees warming uh, globally if all countries met their 2030 pledges. Uh, and then maybe about two degrees warming uh, if countries met their sort of longer term 2050, 2060 net zero commitments uh, or net zero promises. Um, and again, you know, those the, the latter category should be heavily discounted, right? It's it's easy for leaders to say they're going to do something 30, 40, 50 years in the future when they're not going to be in power or in most cases even alive. Uh, it's a lot harder to actually, you know, deliver on that. And the extent to which we should take those long-term promises seriously 
uh, really depend on the extent to where they're reflected in, in near-term commitments. And, and there we definitely have seen a, a big gap between these sort of long-term promises countries have made and, and their near-term commitments. Uh, but sort of coming out of COP26, you know, we moved the needle in a few different ways. Um, in terms of these near-term commitments, uh, so back in 2020, a year ago, uh, Climate Action Tracker, which is probably the, the best source for these projections, uh, said that 2030 commitments put on track for us on track for about 2.6 C warming by 2100. Uh, going into COP26, updates over the past year as, as countries submitted new NDCs uh, brought that down to about 2.4 degrees. Uh, if you add on top of that some small NDC updates at COP26, the new methane pledge, the coal phase out, the deforestation pledge, that might shave you know a, another tenth of a degree C off uh, 2100 outcomes. So you're, you're down to about 2.3 C. Um, and again, every tenth of degree matters. Uh, similarly, if you look at these long-term net zero pledges, going into COP, our best estimate was around 2 or 2.1 C uh, outcome in 2100. Uh, with the new commitment by India uh, and a few other countries, uh, that's dropped down to about 1.8 degrees C uh, if all of these net zero commitments are met, uh, which would be the first time we've really seen you know, pledges by countries to do things on the ground that was a result in less than 2 degrees warming globally. Uh, and about a, a two and three chance of avoiding two degrees warming globally, um, which is significant. So there is some good news on that front, but again, it's this gap between long-term ambition and near-term commitments that's really worrying, right? Um, and you know, countries like China, uh, you know, like India, um, and, and to an extent, even rich countries uh, like Japan, Australia, uh, the US, the EU, need to do more in terms of near-term commitments uh, to put us on track to get to these sort of net zero promises. Uh, and I think that's gonna be really the, the task in the lead up to COP27 next year is firming up these short-term commitments and, and really you know, bringing them in line with the emission reduction pathways needed to, to meet these long-term net zero promises. Um, so that's the good news. The bad news is that you know, I think coming into COP26, the idea of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees was on life support, you know, coming out, nothing's impossible. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's, it's becoming harder to imagine a world where we actually take action fast enough to, to limit warming to, to 1.5 degrees, at least in the absence of uh, a very large amount of net negative emissions later in this century or next century. Um, so if we want to limit global temperatures to 1.5 degrees with a reasonable chance of doing so, um, and not overshooting it by much, uh, and even the, these scenarios have some overshoot, they usually end up peaking temperatures at 1.60, uh, we would have to reduce global emissions by about 45% in the next decade. And no one is making commitments to do that today. Um, you know, some rich countries like the US uh, and the EU and the UK have committed to reduce their emissions by 50%, uh, but you can't expect countries like India uh, or you know, Sub-Saharan Africa or Indonesia or, or even Brazil to make similar types of commitments given you know, the rapidly growing economy is given the need to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. So a world where you actually had a 45% reduction by 2030 involved much, much greater reductions in the rich world and bigger reductions in the developing world than we've seen today. Uh, and no one seems to be willing to commit to that right now. And so in the absence of those sort of commitments, it's just really hard to see a scenario where 1.5 stays alive. Now, what you could have is a world where we do end up having some strengthening of commitments. We end up on a pathway for maybe 1.7 C by the middle of the century. And then the rich world promises in a big way to invest in carbon removal. So actively sucking carbon out of the atmosphere such that by the end of the century, we're maybe removing half of what we emit today uh, in addition to minimizing our emissions globally uh, and getting that as close to zero as possible. In that sort of world, you could have an overshoot by a couple tenths of a degree in the middle of the century and then ultimately end up around 1.5 by the end of the century. Uh, and to be honest, that's what a lot of the models in the IPCC, for example, that actually get to 1.5 degrees tend to do. Of course, the challenge with that is you're talking about a sort of planetary scale engineering challenge later in the century with technology that's very, very nascent today. Uh, and so, you know, while it would be great if that ends up panning out, then I think we should invest a lot more money in, in seeing if we can, you know, make that technology cheaper because it is going to have to be part of the solution. Um, it's also very dangerous to bet on um, and to sort of give people false hope that we'll necessarily have a route to get there. So uh, in my view, you know, we're so close to one and a half degrees today, we're at 1.2 today, the remaining carbon budget is so small uh, that at this point, 
limiting warming to below 1.5 degrees without overshooting the target is, is pretty much dead. Uh, and I think you know, the extent to which we do have hope to ultimately get temperatures down to 1.5 degrees is, is going to end up depending a lot on carbon removal technologies and how fast we can get our emissions to zero to minimize the amount of overshoot we have. Sure, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess then I'd be interested in your, in your thoughts or what um, I guess the movement, a kind of degrowth movement uh, would think. So I guess they came at it saying, well, we've got to do that. And, uh, you know, degrowth is the answer. Um, but it seems to me, you know, particularly seeing through the pandemic and seeing that and seeing the fact that you've got to lift so many people out of poverty, uh, I guess the kind of economic consensus is that degrowth really uh, doesn't work for that. And then you end up maybe on the super optimistic end of a kind of, um, I guess, what would the degrowth people say? They'd say, oh, you just got tech bros where innovation uh, uh, saves the world. Um, and I guess you had a little bit of a um, pushback from degrowth with a sort of uh, eco-modernist um, type of, uh, you know, ideas and things coming up and like the tension uh, between the two. Um, maybe you would have some comments on, on that from your position about, you know, to what elements um, degrowth is just really unrealistic or are there any things we can take away from that? And to what elements are we too optimistic or not optimistic enough on what uh, innovation and tech uh, could maybe bring us? Yeah, I mean, on the question of degrowth, what is ultimately limiting our ability to reduce emissions today is not the scenarios that climate scientists are putting together or energy modelers are putting together. It's, you know, both the costs of clean energy technologies and the political willingness to take action rapidly to reduce emissions if it comes at a cost to society. Uh, and I think the biggest problem with degrowth is it's hard to see how that moves the needle on that problem, right? It's, it's not a popular thing. There's not a huge movement to support policies that shrink our economy and, you know, reduce jobs or otherwise, you know, uh, so much of what makes our politicians popular today is promises of growth. Um, and so it just strikes me as kind of a dead end in terms of actually getting near term action on climate change barring some sort of, you know, global consciousness shift around the issue that, that we're seeing very little signs of. Today. Um, so I, I think there's a, a real challenge in political salience there um, that has to be addressed. The other challenge, of course, is that most future emissions growth comes from countries that are poor today, um, where economic growth is, in fact, essential to lift billions of people out of poverty, um, certainly hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Uh, and so, you know, we actually have seen most rich countries starting to reduce their emissions over the past decade. Uh, I think 32 countries have now seen falling emissions uh, despite rising GDP. Uh, and in some cases like the UK, they've fallen close to 50% already. Um, so I think so we do have a pathway where we can reduce emissions in a way that isn't politically toxic, in a way that doesn't, you know, lead to, you know, hardship for people, uh, and in a way that can potentially create a path for countries that are poor today to, to follow in the footsteps. Um, you know, a country like India is only going to make a net zero commitment, or even a country like China, for that matter, if they see a way to do so that does not put at risk their development trajectory. Uh, and I think the fact that they are willing to make those commitments now is in many ways due to the fact that climate mitigation is seen as much, much cheaper today and much, you know, less damaging to the economy today than it was a decade ago, in large part due to the progress we've made in reducing the cost of clean energy. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to defend excess consumption in rich countries, uh, per se, you know, it's not the hill I choose to die on. Certainly, if people want to, you know, create a movement for people to fly less, for people to drive smaller cars, for people to, you know, take voluntary measures to reduce their own environmental impact by eating less red meat, that's all good stuff. Um, I don't think we're going to have the political buy-in to actually, you know, ban hamburgers, for example, uh, in rich countries anytime soon. And so I'm, I'm much more optimistic about changing emissions in, in those sort of sectors by creating viable alternatives for people. Like, personally, I have switched from eating beef, uh, in the, for the most part, to eating impossible meat, because uh, I think it tastes just as good. Uh, you know, it might cost a dollar more per patty. Um, but you know, it's an alternative that I can stick into the same dishes that doesn't involve a huge change and that has, you know, a, a tiny fraction of the, the climate impact of, of eating beef. And so the more we can develop those sort of solutions that can sort of slot into our lives as they are today, I think the more seamless and rapid a transition we'll see rather than, you know, asking people to fundamentally change their way of life um, 
you know, in, in some cases, we may have to push bigger shifts uh, in sectors where it's, there are no other alternatives. Um, but I think so far we've we've had a pretty good track record of, of finding alternatives that, you know, have many of the same benefits of, of the uses of fossil fuels that people enjoy today. Sure. Um, at the same time, I think there definitely is a, a risk of being sort of too techno optimist. Um, you know, there is a, a column by Thomas Friedman in the Times yesterday that definitely fell into this trap. It's like we need more Elon Musk's and nuclear fusion is the future. Um, which is not to say that you know we, we don't need more innovators and, and that throwing tons of money around uh, 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 into clean energy solutions and even long-term things like fusion is a bad idea. It's just that looking at those in isolation, uh, seeing you know technology and sort of entrepreneurship and the free market is, is somehow divorced from the policy context is is problematic uh, and dangerous. You know, a, a lot of or almost all of the technologies that are mature today uh, that reduce our emissions from wind to solar to electric vehicles um, to nuclear fusion, uh, which is, you know, potentially on the horizon in the next two decades, out of an enormous amount of government research. Spent, um, and policy support. And, and policy support, yes. Uh, and so, yes, we need to spend more money on innovative technology and the fact that, you know, the private sector is throwing a, a tsunami of money at this technology right now is a good thing, you know. Uh, just uh, last week, uh, Riven, uh, an automobile, electric automobile company, went public here in the U.S. Uh, despite having never sold a vehicle, they now are more valuable than Ford Motor Company yeah. uh, in terms of their valuation. $180 billion um, market over, cap. <laughs> yeah, which is ridiculous. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's certainly a sign that the market sees this as the future, that they're willing to throw huge amounts of money after it, and it's going to accelerate a transition. But in the absence of policy, it's not going to happen fast enough. And so, you know, I think if you're a techno optimist, you can make the case for maybe a 2.5 degree world or, you know, maybe even 2.3, 2.2 degree world as, as something that could come out in a world where we had relatively limited policy, but a huge amount of innovation and sort of optimism around technology. Uh, but it's going to be very hard to well below two degrees without, you know, real government action to, to internalize externalities, to subsidize the adoption of these technologies. Uh, and to build a lot of the sort of support systems necessary for these technologies to scale. Um, renewable energy is actually a great example here. You know, wind and solar costs have fallen tremendously, but they fa face real challenges to scaling up uh, in the absence of, of large scale public investments in transmission, for example, uh, and, you know, reform to environmental laws to more easily permit those and accelerate them uh, in, in investments in battery storage uh, and other ancillary grid, grid services. Um, so there is a need for, you know, more innovation and, and, you know, more private sector work in this. And we are seeing a lot of positive signs there, but we also need a lot more government policy support to, to really get us uh, the speed of the transition that we need to, to meet our climate goals. Great. Okay. That makes a lot of sense to me. So that's kind of, um, uh, yeah, because my son now eats some possible meat rather than normal burgers because he thinks it's pretty much the same. Um, and I guess Bill Gates has been going on and on about this, although maybe he's a tiny bit techno optimist um, as well. <laughs> maybe we'll have um, um, a quick fire kind of overrated or underrated section, or you could just do a quick comment because some of it's some um, kind of either or, or or not. If you find it interesting, we can we can do. So I'll shoot out a phrase or an idea and you can go, oh, I think that's overrated because of X or underrated because of Y. Um, uh, so we'll start with maybe one that you uh, mentioned uh, which is nuclear power, uh, but maybe particularly uh, mini nukes. Um, do you think this is maybe overrated or underrated or any thoughts? Depends a lot on who you talk to. Uh, <laughs> I'd say probably overall a little underrated uh, in mm -hmm. part because one thing that's come out of the energy modeling world in the last few years uh, is that you know there is a real need for what we call clean firm generation. So renewables, variable renewables in particular can go a long way. At the end of the day, you're, you're going to need 20 to 30 percent of your power to come from sources that, you know, can be available when needed, um, that are not subject to the whims of uh, when the wind is blowing and when the sun is shining, even in a world where you have a lot of transmission and storage. Um, and so, you know, nuclear is not the only option there. There's a huge amount of uh, advances happening in geothermal. There's a lot of people very excited about green hydrogen as sort of a, a way of firming up variable renewables and, and doing seasonal storage, um, though there's a lot of challenges there. Uh, but certainly nuclear is, is one of the best technologies we have for that purpose today. Um, so, you know, I'd say it's a little underrated overall, but the jury's still out in terms of if we can manage to build them sort of on time and on budget and see the same sort of learning curves we've seen with uh, renewable energy technologies. Sure, that seems very fair. Um, carbon offsetting. 
Um, I'd say it's overrated. Uh, there are a lot of companies today that are carbon neutral companies that have maybe reduced their actual emissions by 20% and then have bought a whole bunch of dirt cheap forestry related offsets um, to, to call themselves carbon neutral to cover the other 80%. Uh, and the problem is, you know, if you take carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in the biosphere, it's not gonna stay there forever. Um, a lot of the wildfires we've seen in California this year were burning through corporate carbon offset projects. Um, and so, you know, I think if companies were actually paying, you know, $600 a ton to do direct air, air capture and verifiably put that carbon into geologic storage, it would be a very different story. Um, but, you know, to the extent that carbon offsetting today is dominated by often, to be honest, bullshit forestry offsets, uh, I think it's a real problem. And, and a lot of it is greenwashing. And I think we need better differentiation in that market between, you know, permanent carbon removal, um, which is actually what's needed to, you know, counteract a ton of carbon that's emitted, which is going to stay in the atmosphere for, you know, tens of thousands of years uh, versus sort of temporary removal. Um, and to the extent that, you know, we are planting trees, uh, we need, you know, very good systems to ensure that they stay in that location or that location remains forested for thousands of years to come to be equal to avoiding a, uh, you know, ton of CO2 emitted, which is a big challenge in a warming world, which has, you know, much stronger stressors for uh, the biosphere. Yeah. Even high, even the higher quality nature-based solutions are, uh, you know, there's a difference between low quality offsets and high quality, but even the high quality ones are, are not necessarily set in stone, like you say, if they're in, in the biosphere. That seems very fair. Yeah. So um, we, we should actually try to set more of them in stone, quite literally. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, uh, I guess this is a sort of an investment thing, but uh, I guess the movement is, uh, a divestment movement or maybe an engagement movement? What do you think about divestment strategies? I have mixed feelings about them. You know, I think they've been very successful in mobilizing people. I think they've, you know, certainly had a big effect on the economics of some projects in terms of the ability to get capital. Um, but I think we're also starting to see a little bit of a challenge right now in the strategies of targeting supply rather than demand. Um, you know, if you make it tough for people to get money to develop fossil fuel projects and you end up having production fall and prices rise, then there's huge amounts of political blowback and you end up with the US, you know, pressing for dramatic expansions of oil production despite, you know, going all in on climate. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I think it's, it, it is useful. And I think particularly when it comes to coal, it's quite useful because there's very little justification for, you know, investing anything in coal uh, today. Um, but, you know, I think we need to make sure that all of these sort of supply side interventions were happening are, are happening in conjunction with demand side reductions as well, you know, subsidizing electric vehicles so people are less sensitive to the cost of oil, you know, subsidizing heat pumps so people are less affected by swings in natural gas prices and those sort of things. Uh, and I think there's a definite danger of political blowback uh, if we focus too much on the supply side and not enough on the demand side. Sure. Um carbon tax or I guess carbon prices markets that whole uh, area of, of trying to price carbon uh, overrated <laughs> I mean uh, a carbon price is a necessary but not sufficient condition to deep decarbonization uh, and by that I mean you know at the end of the day there are some things that you're probably going to want a carbon price to do but at the same time you know we have swings in terms of fossil fuel costs that are much bigger than any price on carbon that we're talking about imposing frequently in, in terms of, you know, gasoline prices or petrol prices. Uh, and it has a relatively small effect on people's actual behavior. And so, you know, I, I think that carbon prices have been a little oversold in terms of their at least near-term effectiveness. Uh, certainly if we're focusing on meeting targets, they don't have any sort of guarantees of, of actual efficacy in, in terms of reductions. Uh, but also there's just particularly here in the US, not much political salience for, for carbon pricing. You know, even progressive Washington state, which tried to get a, a tax and dividend, uh, revenue neutral carbon tax through, uh, failed miserably on a, a popular referendum. And there's no appetite at all to pass carbon taxes today, either from the left or the right in the US uh, in politics. Um, and so, you know, it would be nice. And, and I, I understand why economists love it. And as a someone who's dabbled in economics over the years, you know, I. I did my uh, master's thesis uh, at Yale a, a decade ago on sort of making tradable permit systems more tax-like. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we need to go with what can actually be done. And so, you know, yes, 
to the extent that we can do a carbon price, good, but we shouldn't rely on it as our primary mechanism to reduce emissions. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Um, gas as a transition fuel or gas placed within, I guess, our energy systems? Um, a decade ago, it was not overrated. Today, it's overrated, uh, in part because, you know, have, at least in the rich world, transitioned away from coal in a large way. U.S. coal use is down 60% in the last 12 years. U.K. coal use is pretty much zero now. Um, Europe, some countries are doing a little worse in that transition. Um, but even there, you know, we're, we're quickly running into a case where gas is becoming the sort of the worst marginal emitter as, as coal is phased out of, of many areas. Uh, and so, you know, yes, we reduced emissions by replacing a lot of coal plants with gas. Uh, but today, increasingly, renewable energy is, is cost competitive. Um, there's much less of a justification today to the new gas infrastructure, given the alternatives available. Um, and so, and in particular, in, in many places like the US, we already have too much gas infrastructure today, um, which, you know, will play a role in helping balance out renewable generation in the near term until we get other sort of clean energy, clean form technologies available and, and more battery storage and transmission and all these other things. Um, but you know, today I, I just think there's much less of a role for gas replacing coal than there was a decade ago. We've we've already replaced most of what we can economically there. Yeah, that also makes a lot of sense. And is is the fact that things have things have changed and changed quite quickly within within a decade. Yeah. Um, uh, and idea... it's also worth pointing out that you know, with with methane leakage, you know, gas is better than coal, uh, but yeah. not you know, not as, as brilliant better... as we thought. Exactly. Yeah, and all, the methane leakage thing, the data we have on it is like not so good so it could well be underestimated from what what we've seen and stuff i guess that's an issue as well um the idea mm -hmm. of um a green new deal or i suppose is does a lot of these innovations and things really come with uh new jobs or is that kind of a separate issue so green new deal um so i think in the u.s context the green new deal was an interesting political exercise um i think there is a certain amount of danger to sort of attaching a wide range of other unrelated social policies to climate measures like you know a, a guaranteed jobs program or universal health care all these other things which are good in their own right um, but you know to the extent that we want climate policy to be something that can be durable um, you know ultimately it, it can't just be a big left issue, right? You know, we, a, a permanent leftist majority is not a replacement for effective climate policy. Uh, and countries that have done the best reduce emissions, like the UK, are countries where climate is not so much a polarized issue, um, at least acceptance of the basic science is, is certainly not. Um, and so, you know, I, I think there's definitely some challenges there. On the jobs front, there are a lot of jobs in installing clean energy. There's a lot less jobs in maintaining clean energy than there are fossil fuels. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that distinction is important. Uh, and certainly there are a lot of regions where many of the jobs today are tied up in fossil fuel production, where you know, you're not gonna be able to see a one-to-one -one replacement, particularly in terms of geographic concentration of, of future clean energy jobs. Um, so I think you know, as we're moving toward a, a world of more clean energy and less fossil fuels, you know, we do need to always keep in mind sort of the need for a just transition um, and to help those who will be most impacted by these changes uh, and not just sort of say, well, we're going to create more jobs by installing solar panels so we don't have to worry about it, right? It's, it's a much more complicated issue than that. Excellent. Yep, that makes a lot of sense to me as well. Um, perhaps coming through to the last uh, couple of questions then, um, I was wondering if you had any view on um, the, I guess, the Bjorn Lomborg position, which is... Uh, I guess I'd simplify it, is that we're concentrating on on the wrong things that actually if we invested in all of these other areas, you would get uh, a much better deal for all of this and that the overemphasis on some of this cli climate thing is a kind of misallocation of uh, of resources. Uh, and maybe I would extend the sort of uh, the commentary if you if you would to the fact that the, this just still seems to be uh, maybe as unhelpfully for an outsider looking in. Um, quite a lot of heated debates. I guess you get this in a lot of sciences in, in general, uh, but you, you get people and they kind of commentating against one another and it, and it doesn't seem like that they're, they're very aligned. 
uh, which I guess causes some confusion. And I can I can see this in when I speak to some of my friends, but be interested, yeah, generally on the Lombok position and then w whether there is, uh, whether the consensus around where science can, can be, can ever get to a position where you're not going to get these kind of heated debates or, or seemingly sniping at one another. Yeah, I mean, on the Lomberg position, I, I think fundamentally his his mistake is assuming that everything is zero sum, right? You know, when it, when mm -hmm. it comes to climate mitigation and poverty alleviation and all these other pressing issues that the world faces, we can sort of, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time, so to speak. Um, you know, certainly if your criticism was misallocation of resources, you can make a much stronger claim around, say, military spending than climate mitigation spending uh, in terms of reallocation to humanitarian measures or poverty alleviation. Um, I think we're increasingly realizing that, you know, climate impacts and climate mitigation are tied into development uh, in a way where you can have, you know, mutually beneficial outcomes, particularly if rich countries can get their act together and actually help subsidize the adoption of clean energy technologies by poor countries uh, in a big way. Um, and that's been a huge area of, of battle in the international arena. It's one of the biggest flashpoints uh, in Glasgow uh, is sort of around this question of, you know, to what extent should rich countries be paying poor countries to help both adapt to climate change, but also to mitigate climate change. Uh, and I think poor countries have a very strong argument there. And they're like, look, you know, you rich countries destroyed the environment in your development process, and now you want to slam the door behind you. Um, and I think that, you know, balancing that out and, and ensuring that poor countries have a way to meet their development goals robustly while transition to clean energy is, is critically important. Um, but again, going back to the point I made earlier, I think that that's become much less of a trade-off now than it was a decade ago. And I think the fact that we are starting to see all of these big net zero commitments uh, and you know, even some more near-term commitments by poor countries is really an acknowledgement that there is not necessarily a large net cost, cost or even in some cases, even a net cost to transitioning away from fossil fuels. Um, you know, obviously, it depends how rapidly you do it. If you ask India to get its emissions to zero in 20 years, that would impose a huge cost and, and have a big conflict with development priorities. Um, but I think we we now see a, a pathway to at least a, a below two degree world um, where countries are not really bearing much of a cost in the transition, um, in part because we've seen such dramatic cost declines in fossil fuel alternatives. Um, and so I, I, I don't think there is nearly as much of a trade-off as folks like Bjorn would uh, emphasize. Lumberg also is just, to be honest, a, a bit of a consummate cherry picker on these issues. Right. My favorite yes. example of his work is uh, he did a paper looking at the impact of the Paris Agreement, um, which I think we'd all recognize now, you know, along with these longer term technology trends, has had a big impact in, in changing, you know, our future warming trajectories. Uh, back then, he argued that, well, countries will just meet their 2030 pledges, and then in 2031, they'll go back up to RCP 0.5 emission pathways. And therefore, Paris will only cut global temperatures by like not 0.2 C or something. Um, which, yes, in, in that very tortured construction, it would, but it's sort of ignoring, you know, everything else that's going on. Um, and so I think, you know, you, you often need to take some of Bjorn's work with a, a grain of salt around those sort of things, because he does have a bit of an axe to grind in these issues. Uh, he's yeah. not always wrong, um, but he's often cherry picking. Yeah, he makes his point and then finds the model to back it up. <laughs> yep. Uh, in terms of sort of scientist consensus on climate, like, there's not much fundamental disagreement in the scientific community around the basics here, right? You know, the earth is warming, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, we're responsible for CO2 emissions, therefore we're responsible for, you know, most of the warming the world has experienced. Where there are big scientific disagreements is, you know, what is climate sensitivity, exactly how much is the earth gonna warm in the future? You know, what are these various tipping elements or feedbacks, you know, and there's a lot of different views there. Um, and I think, you know, the way that science happens in academic journals and at conferences is, is fairly divorced from the way it gets presented in the media. Um, it's gotten a little bit better, but you still see a lot of sort of both sides presentations in the media in a way that isn't really reflective of the scientific literature or the scientific community, uh, certainly not the way I, I've experienced at conferences. And we actually have some pretty good mechanisms for reaching consensus and, and communicating that consensus through the IPCC process. And if you ever read IPCC reports, they are very cautious. In fact, some people criticize them for being too cautious on emphasizing you know, what we know and where the remaining uncertainties are. Um, and I think that that process has really been helpful for the community to sort of synthesize their knowledge, to talk across the many different disciplines that make up climate science, 
uh, and get a much more unified voice from the scientific community on this issue than, to be honest, you even see in, in other scientific fields, like medical science could really use an IPCC, for example, as we've seen with all of the, you know, fights over masking and vaccination and everything else involved with COVID. Um, I, I feel like in some ways, climate scientists are a bit ahead of the game. Yeah, I know. Like extend that into uh, economics. I'm reading some macro um, economics. They can't agree on inflation or interest rates on some, you would have thought, some of their very basic building blocks. There are massive disagreements still going on there. Uh, great. And so um, maybe then the last question would be, uh, what advice uh, might you have? Perhaps maybe advice to people who want to be uh, involved in the climate cause, um, you know, your thoughts on what you've seen and where you might want to get involved or, or what you might want to do, be a climate scientist, I guess, get involved in policy or, or however you might want to do it. I mean, yeah, what advice do you have people uh, who are thinking about climate? I mean, build a useful skill that fits into a good niche, be that, you know, data analytics, be that communication and writing, be that, you know, climate modeling or economic modeling. Uh, and find an organization that's aligned with your interests on that. You know, one of the challenges with working in the climate world um, is, you know, it's you're not going to make as much money as if you work for Google, right? You know, the the fact that so many people want to make a positive impact on the future means that organizations, particularly environmental and nonprofits, tend to have relatively low salaries, in part because they have a flood of interested and highly qualified people wanting to do that work. Um, and so, you know, unless you're working for a hot clean tech startup, you're probably not going to make a huge amount of money out of doing climate work. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, you're going to have a much bigger impact than you would if you were optimizing the advertising algorithm for some web based company. Um, and so there are trade offs there uh, when you're thinking about careers. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the quality of life you have knowing that your work is making a difference in the world is, is much more valuable than, you know, maximizing your 401k. Um, so I'd say, you know, find a niche, find an organization that's aligned with your values and you know see the biggest impact you can make there great uh well that strikes me as being excellent advice so uh with that uh zeke i would like to say thank you very much thank you it was great to be on if you appreciate the show please like and subscribe as it helps others find the podcast